I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. I just feel it needs to be said, we all have to start somewhere. Everyone is a beginner at some point in your life, at whatever it is you are doing, whether that's sewing or costuming or learning how to pose for pictures or anything really. So please do not be afraid to start. I started my costuming journey way back in 2005. This is also when I started to teach myself how to sew. You know, before YouTube and such was even a thing. So my early projects, they're not really very good. And I know that now, but luckily in a world before social media, I really didn't have anything to compare myself to at the time. So I was actually pretty darn proud of myself. And you know what? If you are just starting out sewing, no matter what you make and no matter how it turns out, you should be proud of yourself too. Because you did the thing! Sewing is hard and it takes a lot of practice to make things look right. And here I am, 16 years later, which is honestly a pretty scary thought, and I still make mistakes and still do things wrong. Heck, if you have been following my Cinderella project, you know that I got hung up on that Bertha and worked myself up over it for a month because it just felt like too much for me. It's okay to mess up and it's okay to not be perfect. That's how we learn. So anyway, I figured in this video, we would take a journey back in time and take a super quick look at every costume I have ever made, which is kind of a lot, so hopefully this video won't be too long. Before we jump in though, one thing I've noticed about my costuming journey, besides the fact that generally speaking, I have found that I tend to improve at least a tiny bit with each project, is that for much of my costuming life, I have counted it in years that start and end with each costume college. And if you're not familiar with Costume College, it's a costuming event held near Los Angeles, California every summer. And it's three days of classes, plus social events, tours, and hanging out with so many wonderful costuming friends whom I generally only get to see once a year. I've been attending Costume College since 2011, so for most of the years that I've been active with historical costuming, my brain kind of keeps track of the costumes that I've made depending on which costume college they were worn at. So it's really only the little bit before I started attending, plus now the last couple of years due to the pandemic, that it's more difficult to keep track of what I've made. So with all that said, let's go back in time to 2005. My very first sewing project was just a gourd skirt, but my second project was a Harry Potter costume. I made this gray skirt and the black robe, complete with digital camera pocket and wand pocket. No seams are finished, and the skirt godets and waistband are super wonky, but it still looks halfway decent from afar. These pictures are actually from several years later in 2012, since apparently I didn't take any pictures of all of my earliest projects. In quick succession to the Harry Potter costume, I also made a Renaissance dress and a Regency dress. The Renaissance dress was made out of pan velvet and poly jacquard using Simplicity 9929. I didn't know how to alter patterns at the time, so it wound up being too small, and I had to add a little extension panel in the back using Velcro. Yep. I wound up wearing it when I was in Once Upon a Mattress, hence the crazy makeup. The Regency dress was made out of old sheets and pillowcases using Butterick 6630. It had a fake lace-up closure in the back, meaning that it was impossible to get on. And there's also exposed interfacing all throughout the bodice with no lining. I also made this really strange overrobe to go with it out of poly suede or moleskin fabric with a weird tulle collar, and it velcroed up the front. I no longer have the overrobe, but I think the other two costumes are still at my parents' house, and I actually have the Harry Potter robe with me since I pull it out for trivia events and things like that. Now we're going to fast forward a few years to when I was in college. College was when I started to get into costuming, though it was pretty much all theatrical. 
I actually got a minor in costume design and did work study in the costume shop and dressed or wardrobe mistress most of the shows. So once I started working there, I had access to a sewing machine again. In 2008, I made this Alice costume for my friend to go along with the Queen of Hearts costume I made for myself, which was modeled after the Queen of Hearts Barbie. The skirt had quarter inch unfinished seam allowances between all of those strips of cotton. So yes, when I went to go wear it again a few years ago, most of those seams had shredded. And I used Rigeline boning in the bodice, which by a few years ago had started to disintegrate. It also obviously didn't really fit right. This was made out of Simplicity 4092, which was a Pirates of the Caribbean pattern, and naturally was not worn with stays that first time. But here's a picture from after I altered and repaired it in 2019 and was wearing it with stays, and it's fitting a lot better now. In 2009, I kind of began my historical costuming journey, though only after making myself a fantasy gown for a Yule Ball that my school held. My friend commissioned me to make him pumpkin pants in a doublet to wear to a Ren fair. I said yes, charged him the very low sum of $60 plus the cost of the fabric, and decided to make myself something and tag along. I made myself this princess seamed bodice because I didn't know better, a peasant blouse, a couple of skirts, and some bracers, and I was ready for my first Ren fair! <laughs> I fell fully into the Ren Faire thing, attending, I think, five different Ren Faires that spring and summer. I also started to make some 18th century stays, though I did not actually finish them for a couple of years. Oh, and I made myself a Tudor gown, which was the big project for one of my classes my junior year, and it never fit right, and I've honestly been meaning to sell it for years, but I feel like it looked impressive at the time. <laughs> I also basically patterned it myself since I finished this gown about one month before Simplicity released a super similar looking Tudor gown pattern that would have been super, super helpful. And then I graduated in December 2009 and I didn't have a sewing machine again until summer of the next year. 2010, though, was when my actual historical costuming journey began. Somehow, through my online involvement in a Ren Faire message board, I found out that there were people out there who did historical costuming for other eras. <laughs> I also found out about Dickens Fair, and I started to actually research historical costuming more in depth. What I consider to be my first historical costume is this velvet doublet gown, and I believe I used Simplicity 3782 to make it. I made an Elizabethan corset using the Elizabethan corset generator, a Franken smock, which I talked about in my costuming hacks video, which if you haven't seen that, I will link that down below, and an underskirt with a hand beaded four part that snapped onto the underskirt so that I could potentially change it out with other four parts in the future, though of course I never did. There was a velvet overskirt and then also the velvet doublet bodice. I ran out of time to make sleeves, though I had planned originally to make paned sleeves to go over the white sleeves of the Frankensmock. I followed that up immediately with my first non Renfair costume, a mid-Victorian ensemble to wear to Dickens Fair, made from Simplicity 3727, and that consisted of a cartridge pleated skirt, Garibaldi blouse, and a pagoda sleeved bodice. At the same time as that, I also made a frock coat for my dad and a skirt for my mom. Although this doublet bodice gown and Victorian ensemble are over 10 years old at this point, and were some of my earliest work, I actually still wear both of them. And in fact, I've used the Victorian one as a costume in multiple theatrical productions, so it's probably been worn maybe more than anything else I've made. Now that we've gotten through my earliest work, let's speed things up a bit. The summer of 2011 was my first costume college, and pretty much every year I've made approximately six different ensembles for myself in order to wear them to costume college at the end of each of my costuming years. So that this video isn't too long, a lot of these pictures may pop up on screen only briefly. If you want to see these pictures a little slower, I will leave a link in the description to my totally out of date portfolio gallery on my website, which has pretty much everything I've made through 2017 on it, since that's the last time I updated it. You can also check out my Instagram at LadyRebeccaFashions, where I have shared all of my more recent costumes. 
In 2011, I was still very much a beginner, learning on my own and through other people I had found on LiveJournal. This outfit was inspired by the theme of costume college that year, which was pre-Raphaelite, combining that aesthetic with one of Eowyn's costumes from Lord of the Rings. In the end, though, it turned out I didn't like it enough to wear it anywhere at all, and it is, I think, my only completely unworn costume. I followed that up with a light and flowy chemise a la reine, my gala gown, which was a 17th century gown that was inspired, I think, by my love of the movie Stage Beauty, and my first fitted 18th century gown, a cotton print robe a l'anglaise, with the hand-sewn on furrow pleats down the back that took me forever to do. <laughs> and I finished this 1950s cocktail dress that I had started a couple years earlier, based on one by Jean Desay that I'd seen at the V&A. I also made this 1940s play suit, which was a romper with a separate skirt. As soon as I got home from costume college, I made this early 1900s ensemble, made of poly chiffon and lots of lace, plus an Edwardian skirt and shirtwaist for my mom. I also finished the Victorian corset I had started in a class at costume college. My first Victorian corset! <laughs> Then came my Halloween costume, which was both my first cosplay and my first bustle dress, which was Jane Porter from Disney's Tarzan. And before Dickens Fair that year, I upgraded my mom's ensemble by making her a pagoda sleeve bodice like mine. The rest of that year's costumes included my pink and white candy striped dress and cage crinoline that you saw in the 100 Years of Plus Size Fashion video, which I will link down in the description below in case you missed it and a pink 1950s vintage Vogue dress made out of leftover fabric from the candy stripe dress. I got on a bit of a 1912 kick in the spring, what with the upcoming 100 year anniversary of the Titanic, and made a 1912-ish corset, princess slip, and linen skirt. I also started a 1912 dinner dress ensemble, but that actually wound up turning into a UFO or unfinished object, so I will come back to that later. Then I made two different historical bathing suits, an 1890s one made of light blue wool and a mid-19-teens one with a cotton flannel tunic and wool shorts. P.S. Wool in a bathing suit? Way better than cotton. And for the gala, I made a ball gown bodice with attached overskirt to be worn with the skirt of my mid-Victorian ensemble. Moving on to the next year's costumes, in August 2012, I started on 1780s stays, but in October, I switched my Halloween costume, which was totally not historically accurate, but it was inspired by Victorian fancy dress costumes. I was a Victorian fancy dress monarch butterfly. Then I made an 18th century quilted petticoat, finished my 1780s stays, and churned out a couple of 1780s projects to go over them. These included a red wool riding habit inspired by the portrait of Baroness Crussell by Vijay Lebrun, and a robe a la Turc ensemble, which in my case included a separate under bodice and skirt, and then an over gown with short sleeves and a zone front, plus a red wool cloak. And yes, I know that neither of these ensembles are really historically accurate, but I didn't know that at the time. Then I turned to Regency costuming and I made my Regency corset, petticoat, and a little white embroidered cotton dress. I did my first princess dress commission because I used to take princess dress commissions a fair amount, which was a Rapunzel costume with a hand painted skirt. By the way, I'm not mentioning all of the commissions I've done in this video, but I will throw in a few of them, like the princess dresses. And I made myself my first Disney bounds. They were both 1950s inspired ensembles. There was one for Snow White and one for Briar Rose. And I followed those up with my curtain along pet and lair made for a group costume at Costume College where everyone used the Waverly Felicite curtains to make their ensembles. And I went back to the 17th century with a lot more knowledge this time <laughs> and made this orange silk taffeta gown for my gala gown for Costume College which was my first time working with silk taffeta. I feel like 2012 to 2013, besides being super productive for me, was, sewing-wise, also where my skills really started to improve. Even looking at things from the beginning of that year to the end of that year, it feels like a big difference. It was probably a combo of better materials, more research and knowledge, and also the sheer amount that I sewed that year <laughs> really gave me a lot of opportunity to practice. Anyway, on to fall 2013. My big project that fall was that I finally made my first actual bustle gown, if you don't include Jane, which I don't. 
It was a Ravenclaw themed gown out of navy wool and cotton check flannel, and I also made a lobster tail bustle and ruffled petticoat to go with it. I got my brother Quattro 3 that November, which is still the machine I use daily, and I did my first big embroidery project on it, which was a commission for Princess Anna's winter outfit from the first Frozen movie. I also tried to make a Cinderella inspired 1950s outfit in like a night, but that turned out terrible. <laughs> In 2014, I also made a blue wool Regency Spencer, an Elsa costume commission to go along with the Anna one, an 1860s bonnet and mantle, some new Victorian undergarments, my first seaside bustle, which was this light stripy cotton confection, plus a hat to go with that, a super quick Regency dress out of a sari, and then my big project, which was my gala gown that year, a humongous 18th century silk court gown with grand paniers underneath, a trimmed out petticoat and overskirt, and a huge styled wig to go with it. In autumn 2014, I had another Rapunzel commission, though this time I digitized and embroidered the skirt with my new machine. Then I made myself a cosplay of Delicia LaFosse's blue dress from Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, which is one of my all-time favorite movies. I followed that up with some menswear, an 18th century suit for my then boyfriend, and a Victorian vest for my dad to wear to Dickens Fair. 2015, though, was the year I met one of my true loves, the 1830s. <laughs> I made myself my 1831 archery dress, which included a corded petticoat, my bed skirt petticoat, the skirt, bodice, hat, and painted boots. And I also made my gala gown, which, while technically that was based on an 1829 fashion plate, but if you've seen my video on the 1830s fashion evolution, which I will link down below, you will know that what we think of as 1830s fashion actually started in the late 1820s. These were the first times I ever attempted to recreate fashion plates, and naturally I was drawn to a very silly looking gala gown. But hey, that was the style then! Then I made another cosplay for myself, which was Little Red from Into the Woods, with hands smocking all over the front of the dress and a tiny punched design that went all along the edges of the cloak. I also made my green and cream bustle gown with its heavily ruched skirt, fringe trim, and complicated bodice. I finished out that costuming year by reproducing another 1830s fashion plate. <laughs> meant as a bathing or sporting suit, the wording on the plate is unclear, and this is probably still the oddest looking thing I have ever made. On to the next year. Right after costume college ended in August 2015, I made this plaid 1890s ensemble. I'm really going to need to see if I can alter this ensemble to fit my new corset because I love it so much, but it totally doesn't fit this corset now, and it's actually one of the few garments that don't fit my new corsets as opposed to my old corsets. I also made a ball gown bodice to go with the green and cream bustle ensemble. For Halloween that year, which was spent at Disney World, I made myself a Rapunzel dress, and I made my then-boyfriend a Flynn Rider doublet. Then I made a marabou-trimmed Regency capelet and giant muff, and finally got around to finishing that 1912 dinner dress UFO from a few years previously. Following that was another Disney Princess commission, this time for Belle's ball gown. I used silk rayon velvet, dyed it to the right color, and hand-embossed roses onto it with a rubber stamp. It was kind of a lot. In December of 2015, I both bought a house and lost my job, so I finally had a dedicated sewing room and I had the first several months of 2016 to do lots of sewing. So that's exactly what I did. I made my navy Swiss dot Regency dress with its tall orange hat and made my 2016 gala gown, which was a black silk bustle gown trimmed with lots of pleats, braided trim, and fringe. Then came my 1850s sheer dress and a princess commission for Ariel's turquoise gown. Around this time was also when I tried to make a career for myself on Etsy, selling cotton play dress versions of Disney princess characters for children, which basically failed miserably. In fact, if any of you are interested in those, I have been trying to clear out my inventory of samples, so I will link my Etsy shop in the description, but I am also open to offers. I made myself a quick 1950s dress before diving into my two biggest projects that year. The first of which was my 1860s little girl's dress for me, made for a group costume that a few of my friends and I were doing at costume college. 
This was a copy of a dress from the Boston MFA, and it may still be the most labor-intensive thing I've ever made, since all of the trim had to be hand-sewn on. Luckily, while I was hand sewing that, I had my embroidery machine working on my Anna Frozen Fever commission. I digitized the embroidery for that, and my machine spent over 32 hours stitching out all of the embroideries just on the skirt alone. <laughs> and that brings us right up to Costume College 2016. In August, I made my Elizabethan kirtle out of periwinkle wool with velvet bands that were left over from my first doublet gown. Then I started my Halloween costume, which was Mary Poppins' Jolly Holiday Dress. To be honest though, I am probably more disappointed in this costume than in anything else I've made, at least recently, so I have a feeling I will wind up having to remake this one someday. Before jumping into my big lineup of Victorian projects, I made a quick 1950s Disney villain print dress. My big Victorian lineup was because in January of 2017, I would be taking a trip to Minnesota to join some friends for a Victorian weekend. So I needed a winter dress and something that I could go ice skating in. I made an 1870s corset and quilted petticoat first, followed by my green wool faux fur trimmed bustle dress based on this fashion plate. That was quickly followed by my black wool skating bustle with fur trim. And yes, we did go ice skating. <laughs> then I started in on my huge project of that year, my giant turquoise ball gown to wear for the gala, which was a copy of this portrait of Isabel de Bourbon y Bourbon. I needed a new corset first, so I made an 1860s one before completing phase one of the gown, the untrimmed, untrained version. After version one was done, I made a Snow White outfit based on the designer Disney dolls for a group costume at Costume College, and followed that up with a pattern test for the Laughing Moon Police pattern. Finally, in June, I got back to the gala gown, finishing the train with all of its trimmings, plus all of the trimming on the dress. It was a lot, but I felt like a princess, so it was worth it. I had time before Costume College to sneak in one more project, which was Elizabeth Swan's burgundy gown from Pirates of the Caribbean. By the way, the reason that I know when I made all of these was because I used to use LiveJournal and then later Dreamwith, and so I wrote about all of these projects and did a year-end recap every year so I knew what all I had made, and oh my gosh, that was so helpful for this video. So even if you don't use something online and public like that, like the live journal, which I'll link down in the description if you're interested, I would recommend keeping some sort of record, whether it's video, written, etc., of all of the costumes that you make, just so that you know and you can see how you progress. And now on to the next year's projects. I started it off with the yellow deck dress that Rose wears in Titanic, which would be for a group costume at Costume College 2018, as well as a trip to the Queen Mary for pictures. Then I made a quick velvet Regency sleeveless Spencer before returning to the 1830s to make my first plaid 1830s dress and coordinating bonnet, you know, since I now have two plaid 1830s dresses. I returned to the bustle period to make this stripy silk bustle gown, and then ping-ponged back to the Regency for another Laughing Moon pattern test, this time for a silk ball gown. I did some theatrical work next as costumer for the musical Disenchanted, and then turned to the 1890s. I made my ice cream social shirtwaist and skirt outfit, and my gala gown for that year, which was my yellow silk gown with sequined appliques. Oh, and I made a quick Victorian dressing gown, which has actually turned out to be one of the most useful things I've ever made. Right after costume college, I made a light summery 19 teens dress using Butterick 6610 before turning to things for my upcoming Dapper Day trip to Disneyland. For that, I made a 1950s Disney bound of Merida from Brave and a Disney movie poster 1950s style jumper dress. My big project that fall, though, was my own Halloween costume, which was a Frozen Fever Anna costume for myself. Next up was this plaid 1880s bustle dress, which turned out very handy for adventuring. And then I dove into my 1870s fairy godmother bustle project. A whole group of us were doing Disney-inspired bustles for Costume College 2019, and when this extant dress from the Manchester Gallery popped up on my Pinterest, it reminded me of the fairy godmother from Cinderella, so it seemed like it was the perfect match for this project. This is still one of my favorite ensembles I've made. 
I also realized around this time that I needed uh, way more room to store all of these costumes. So I built myself a walk-in costume closet in my garage. Since I'm sure that many of you are super curious about how I store my costumes, do check out in the link up above and also the description down below for a full video on how I store all my costumes. The rest of this costuming year was spent working on my gala gown for Costume College, which was this green and pink striped natural form bustle era confection, as well as working on my 1840s dress, which was made from McCall 7988, which is one of the patterns that Angela Clayton designed. And that brings us up to Costume College 2019. It's weird now thinking that these were the last projects that I've made that I've actually been able to wear to Costume College. I so miss going and I think I'm gonna have to make an extended vacation out of it next year. The rest of these costumes that you'll see have been made since then, obviously, starting with my Rapunzel Dapper Dirndl Bound, as I call it, which I honestly like wearing way more than my actual Rapunzel costume. Also, not quite a costume, but I do feel like I have to include it here. My other big project for fall 2019, which I also made for the same Disney World trip that I made Rapunzel for, was a light up fireworks skirt, where I embroidered all of the fireworks on this glittery fabric and threaded LED lights through the underside of the skirt and made little holes where they would peep through. It's definitely the most technologically savvy thing I've made, but I love it. I spent the rest of fall 2019 making projects for other people, fixing up older costumes like my old Queen of Hearts dress that you saw before, and upcycling or making myself daily wear. So that brings us to January 2020 and the start of this YouTube channel, which means that for pretty much all of the rest of these, you can find videos of some sort if you go through all my old videos. I will also link my 2020 year in review video down below in the description. Of course, Many of these have sadly not been worn for anything more than photo shoots, and I cannot wait till I can stop saying that. My first project of 2020 was my burgundy velvet ribbon early bustle gown based on this fashion plate, followed by my blue pleated cotton tissot inspired early bustle gown, my 1830s Governor Ratcliffe historical Disney ensemble, my Edwardian jumper dress ensemble with shirtwaist, ruffly corset cover, and S-bend corset, my 1890s Elsa project, which is probably the longest I've ever spent on any one project, my 19-teens summer dress based on Butterick 6093, my historical fancy dress costumes, both my 19-teens Hussif dress costume and my 1880s Daisy dress costume, my 1890s bicycle sweater and Victorian style apron and the pattern test for screw patterns, Amalia jacket bodice plus matching petticoat. <laughs> and other non-costume items such as my 1950s Christmas dress or the strawberry dress. So far this year, I have added the peppermint stripey seaside bustle, the 1790s cotton dress in a week basically project, the 1890s wool tea gown modeled after the antique one in my collection, and the green and pink plaid late 1830s dress. And I'm now nearing completion on 1838 Cinderella. I have found that in the last year especially, a lot of my sewing projects have been more directed towards my day-to-day -day wardrobe as opposed to costuming, kind of like the jumpers I've been making lately. I think this is probably due to the desire for instant gratification for projects that are easier and quicker to complete, as well as the fact that with several of my 2020 projects still unworn, it feels a bit silly to keep making even more. So anyway, that is a hopefully complete tour of all of the costumes I've ever made, starting back in 2005 and leading all the way up to 2021. <laughs> there has been a lot of learning in that 16 years, with so many skills developed and so much knowledge gained, and yet I know that I still have so much more to learn. I look forward to where my future projects might take me. I do also really hope this video didn't come off as self-centered or anything like that. I know I have a lot of costumes, but it has taken me a really long time to get here, as you can see from this video. I hope that this video has helped to show that something like historical costuming, or for that matter cosplay, or even just sewing in general on its own, is all part of a journey. Everyone has to start somewhere. The important thing is just to start. And over time, you will develop your skills and abilities and be able to create some magnificent pieces. You just have to believe in yourself and never give up. 
Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful to see the complete path of my costuming journey. If you like this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram. So please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi account down below in the description. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Heidi and Sharon. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!